think that's going. Okay, welcome. You guys, welcome to our fall semester. I'm so excited. It's finally here. So the team, we've been working since June to get ready for this semester. So we're really excited. To, I'm excited to get it going and to have you all here. So um, the way it looks right now and knowing who's not here who plans to join us, we're going to have some space issues. <laughs> we're going to have to fix that. So that's okay. Um, so the way tonight, yes, it is a good problem, and I'm thankful for that. The way tonight is going to work is I'm going to begin by teaching through Ruth chapter 1. And then um, you all are going to, hey, Chelsea, we have a seat right here, right up front. Um, and then we're going to break you all up into study groups. And we've got tables set up, and we may need to set up another table. Um, and you can... For this first semester, you can choose your study group. We'd like it to be no more than six, counting your uh, table leader. And I have table leaders uh, standing by, so you'll get a table leader assigned. And really, their job is just to kind of um, facilitate the conversation. So we'll start with teaching, and then we'll separate to our tables for the last portion of this, where there are discussion questions. There's different kinds of discussion questions. There are some that talk about the context of the Bible, so they're a little bit more, let's look what the rest of the Bible says and how it speaks to the passage that we're, um, or the information it gives us for the passage that we're studying. And then there'll be some closed answered questions that are just like very specific questions about what we see in the text. And then there's a, a ending section with some application questions to help us kind of um, see why does this matter to me? Why does the story of Ruth and Naomi matter to us? And I promise you it does. It does. So we're excited for that. So that's how the, the night will work. Um, also, we have available, I think most of you have, our binders. Um, they look like this. And on the inside, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, it's like all the binders we've had before. Um, mine don't have the papers. Okay, so it has, it should have the, um, the study guide, kind of what we do, the study method of the inductive study method. You do not have to follow this method if that is not, if you've already got something that works well for you, do that. But if you want help in learning how to study the Bible on your own and figure out what it is saying, we have that in there for you. Then the next page, I think, is the schedule. We do have it broken down for those who need it. Please hear me. It is for those who need and want it. I don't follow the weekly schedule because I just tend to do it in big chunks periodically. But I know that there are some that want to do it in smaller chunks. So we did, Chelsea helped us and broke it down to what you do Monday, what you do Tuesday, what you do Wednesday. And it's the same every week. It's a five day study, so you don't have to um, do anything on Saturday and Sunday or make up on Saturday, Sunday, however you want to do that. So, um, so that, that is in there too. Then you also have a double spaced copy of your text in there. We do it the way that we do it so that way you have text on one side and a blank sheet on the other side to help with notes. We, that was Rebecca's genius. And she thought of that, so that helps us. We also have, if you need, um, we have availability for left-handed binders, if you need a left-handed binder. So, okay, so that is your binder. This is your study guide for the study if, if that's what you want. Use it however it works for you, okay? I'm more interested in the fact that you're here and you're studying along with us and we're learning and growing together, okay? So this has help. Modify it as you need it. Do as little as you can or as much as you want to. We're all here kind of learning and growing and doing it together, okay? So no pressure to do what the girl next to you does. If that works for her but doesn't work for you, that's fine. Just do what works for you and let's keep going, okay? So, all right, are we ready to begin? Okay. Okay, so I thought it'd be fun to start with a timeline. This is, um, we're gonna talk a little bit to give ourselves kind of a historical and biblical context for the book of Ruth. So obviously here we have creation. Creation, we read about creation in Genesis. So we have creation. And then we have uh, 
some highlights in Genesis. We have Noah and the flood. Then the big one in Genesis is when God makes his promise to Abraham. Okay? So we have Abraham. And Abraham begins our period of the uh, patriarchs of Israel. So in here, let's see, from Abraham to the end of Genesis, we have the patriarchs. Anybody know who the patriarchs are? Abraham, uh -huh. Isaac, Jacob. Yep, yep, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's got it. He's got it. He knows the answers. <laughs> So then we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At the very end of Genesis, we have the story of Joseph. Joseph is one of my favorite stories because it's one of the first times that God is clearly telling his people how he's going to redeem them. So we have Joseph here at the very end. The story of Joseph then is how the Israelites end up in Egypt. Remember, there was a famine Joseph was kind of ruler over parts of Egypt, brought his brothers in. You guys know that story. So then all of Israel ends up in Egypt. It is God's way of saving his remnant, saving his people. So then, after that, I believe they're in Egypt about 400 years. Israel grows even more and more to finally they're looking like the nation that Abraham, or that God had promised to Abraham. Only problem is they're in captivity. They're not in their land. They're in captivity, and life is not good for them in Egypt. So then we have the Exodus, okay, and the book of Exodus. And this is with Moses. So God uses Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. So they were in Egypt. Now they're going out of Egypt, leads them out of Egypt, and they go to a wonderful place called the wilderness, <laughs> right? <laughs> so they have 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness, wandering under Moses' leadership. So that gets us through Exodus. Um, during Exodus, we also have Leviticus and Deuteronomy, wait, Genesis, Exodus, wait, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Um, and this is where Moses dies. At the end of Deuteronomy, that's the end of what we call the Pentateuch, Moses dies, and he passes his leadership on to Joshua. Okay? Joshua takes the lead. Okay? So now Joshua, when this happens, they're on the edge of Canaan, which is the land that God had promised to Abraham to, to build, to um, take his people to and for them to be a mighty nation in Canaan. So they're finally on the doorstep of Canaan. They've changed leadership. Joshua is in control. And then they, they come to the period of what we call the conquest. So they finally con they, uh, conquer Canaan. So here we've got the conquest. Anybody else have the CC timeline going in on my head? So here they've got the conquest, so they're fighting all of the nations. They're supposed to be destroying all of those nations, so that way they um, are, they're the only ones in that area, okay? But if you know the story, they don't actually do it all the way, right? So then, because they were disobedient and did not really complete the conquest, they just kind of mostly did it, right? Mostly obeyed. But then we get to a pen that doesn't work very well. <laughs> then we get to judges. Okay? The judges is a time period where they were supposed to be, um, they were still fighting off all of the people that they kind of didn't completely um, take care of the first time, causing them trouble, because that's always what happens, right? When we disobey those things that we don't really, aren't fully obedient in, it always comes back to get us. So that's the judges. That's where we get into judges, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we have Ruth. Ruth takes place 
in the time of the judges. So we are now in Ruth, and then just so we kind of know where we're going eventually, we have Ruth, and then you get to First and Second Samuel. First and Second Samuel is important because that is now we have the United Kingdom of Israel. Saul becomes king first, and then we have King David, and it kind of becomes that golden age of Israel. So that's where we're headed, and that's where Ruth is kind of bridging us and getting us to, okay? But this is kind of just a really quick history on where God's people were, where they are now, and a little bit of where they're headed, okay? All right, so the story takes place sometime between 1050 BC and 930 BC. Um, it's between uh, Israel's conquest of Canaan and the kingdom, and then eventual, uh, the kingdom divides, and then they're carried off because, again, disobedience. You guys see Israel's pattern, right? Um, so it would be written sometime after, so written sometime after 1010 BC, because that's when King David um, was, that's, or that's when David became king. And the reason we know that is because they do mention him at the end of the book. They wouldn't have mentioned him if it was written before that. Does that make sense? So they, but they don't really know exactly when. It was possibly written to a divided kingdom with, uh, with the purpose or maybe in an effort to remind them of who they are and whose they are. Okay. So like we said, verse 1 tells us that it was took place in the time of the judges. Israel, with God's help, has conquered the land of Canaan and has settled in the promised land that God spoke of to Abraham, like Graham Goldsworthy. Do you guys remember him from our, I like to call him Goldie, because that he says that's what his friends call him. So um, anyway, he says that they're to be God's people in God's land under God's rule. But they aren't really under God's rule, right? Because they continue to chase after the Canaanite gods rather than remain faithful to the covenant that God made with Abraham. And that finds them in some tight spots, right? Um, battles with the surrounding nations. So God had to raise up the judges to help deliver them, usually through military efforts. Um, and it's really a dark and chaotic period in Israel's history where you'd be really hard pressed to find faithfulness. And yet, this story that we're gonna study, it tells us of a small, insig insignificant family in a small, insignificant town in Judah. We know it's not insignificant. Um, where he uses them to remind his people that he is faithful and that he promises to redeem them. And we're gonna see how God's mercy to outcasts like Rahab and Ruth, as he brings them into the family of God. Did you guys know, do you remember back, um, it would have been in here, uh, Abraham and Lot, and the sin of Lot's daughters? You guys know what I'm talking about? Shake your head out the I'll tell the story. <laughs> Ruth is the undoing of that. It is the undoing. Moab was started out of sin, and Ruth is a Moabitess, and that is the undoing of that as he brings her into his family. Amazing. I love that. I love that about this story. So, um, and it's, and not just that, actually it's lots of daughters, and lots of people to Ruth to the great grand she's the great grandmother of David to Jesus yes can you give us a quick synopsis of Lot's daughter yes so when God promised to destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah Lot was there and his daughters and his family they basically had to be drug out of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, come on in. Come on in, I see you. They had to be drug out, um, and what, 
what happened was they were supposed to, I think they were supposed to go to the mountains where Abraham was watching all of this happen. Lot chose not to do that, and he has to go to a nearby uh, area and hid in some caves with his daughters. Um, they kind of felt like we're out here in the middle of nowhere, we're never going to have children, we're never going to be married, so they got their dad drunk, their babies made, that, and that's where Moab comes from. So, thanks, that's such an awkward story. So, anyway, what I like about Ruth is it's actually a bridge, or even a breath, between the chaos of what we see in Judges and then kind of the pomp and circumstance that we get to see in First and Second Samuel with the kingdom of Israel. In Judges, it's dark. They have deliverers, but man, they leave you wanting a better deliverer because they all fail at some point. Um, and then First and Second Samuel, we do get to read about you know the United Kingdom. So Ruth is where God speaks in a small, still voice. And he's saying, come back to me. I got you. I'll redeem you. I keep my promises. It's not a story with valiant victories or even huge personalities. It's often overlooked. Um, but it is a story that intends to draw us in with kindness and mercy um, and simplicity. And we are intended to see lots of biblical themes. We'll point that out as we go. Um, some of those we'll see are famine and barrenness. And there are lots of contrasts like life, death, full, empty, bitter, and sweet. What makes this book different is that it's a book about a woman hero. We don't get that a whole lot. And not only that, the story is told through the eyes of a woman, through her concerns, meeting her concerns. Isn't it nice to be reminded of God's heart for women? That he hears us, that he's concerned with us, and that he knows what we really need. And that's what we'll see here in Ruth. Okay? Okay. That's my introduction to Ruth. Okay. Raise your hands. Have any of you seen, been watching The Chosen? Yay. I've been watching it. Sorry. I need a drink. Has anybody made it through season two? It's not really a spoiler what I'm going to tell you because you can read it in the Bible. <laughs> So I'm not worried about that. So in one of the, I want to say maybe it's episode four in the second season, they reenact the story of the man at the pool in Bethesda and Jesus coming and healing him. It's an amazing story. The Bible doesn't give a whole lot of dialogue, you know, so it's all extra biblical stuff. I don't think it's contrary to the Bible, but it is extra biblical but it's still so amazing to watch. So Jesus and his disciples approach this man, they call him Jesse, so they give him a name, which I love. Um, and he approaches this man who's been waiting 30 years, wasting his life at this pool, wanting to be healed. So it's, it's the guy that they kept saying, nobody will get me into the pool, so I can't be healed because I'm not the first one in. And the way they built up this story is he has wasted his life just laying there trying to get into the pool and every time he tries somebody gets in there um, first before him what i love about this is when jesus walks into the um, the square area where this this pool is and he sees jesse and he tells his his disciples that's the one and he says the one who's been here the longest and doesn't belong yeah and then he goes to Jesse and he asks them several questions, one of them being, do you want to be healed? And they have this conversation. But then he tells them, this pool has nothing for you. You do, you do not need the pool. You only need me. 
They do not need the pool that he's wasted 30 years at. You only need me. Amazing scene. God will empty us so that we see our need for him and we choose to return to him. God will empty us so we see our need for him and we choose to return to him. We see this in Ruth. The story begins uh, verses 1 through 5. It's a family, story of a family. We have Elimelech, Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons. They travel from Bethlehem to Moab. And if you notice, the author keeps repeating Bethlehem, Bethlehem, and Moab, Moab. He's doing that intentionally because he wants them to understand they left Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread, literally means house of bread. And that's an important, important point. That's the land of God's promise. That's the land of his provision to his people. But it didn't seem that way, right? So there was a famine that came along. God did send a famine to turn their hearts back to him. Empty. Empty. And then there was Moab that um, we talked about. Moab was started by the sin of Lot's daughters. That was kind of like the worst place that they could have chosen to go to. They were haters of Yahweh um, and didn't want to have anything to do with, like you could read more about that, but didn't want to have anything to do with Israel's God. It's like their land of compromise. So they left their land of promise because it felt empty. There was a famine. Decided to go to Moab. The land of compromise, okay? And you know what? Maybe they didn't intend to be there very long. They might have, you know, just kind of thought, oh, we'll just go here for a little bit, get our bellies full with their food since Bethlehem, you know, doesn't have any right now. And, but you know what? Before they knew it, they settled there. Their sons took wives. I don't know how, you know, doesn't get any more permanent than that. Mm -hmm. And even if it was okay that they went to Moab, it was not okay for their sons to marry Moabite women. Okay? So their compromise kind of kept growing the longer that they were there. And we know those women to be Orpah and Ruth. Okay, and then it begins, right? Right off the bat, it begins. Maybe at first it just kind of felt like um, regular life problems, but we start to see the emptying of Naomi, which matches the famine she tried to escape. Elimelech, Elimelech dies, so she loses her husband. Then both of her sons die. And not only that, her daughters-in-law didn't have children. They didn't have sons. I don't know if, as you've read through that, you realize how amazing that is. I can't decide if they were there for 10 years or if their sons and wives had been married for 10 years, but it is still really astounding that these women were barren. Astounding, two women, one family. We're not supposed to miss that, okay? Empty, empty. God will empty us so that we see our need for him. Verses six through 18. So Naomi is now a childless widow in a foreign land. Ian Duguid calls her a remnant of one under the judgment of God. Nobody wants to be there. She has no husband. No sons, no government systems to help her, no job training to help her get on her feet. She is a desolate woman in a patriarchal society. She's got nothing, and she's not even home. So then Naomi hears that God has ended the famine in, Beth in Bethlehem. 
So God provided for his people, and she's not even there to be a part of it because she chose to leave. So she decides, okay, maybe it's time to go home. So she encourages her daughter and daughters-in-law to return to their own families because she's like, I have nothing to offer you. I have no sons for you. You know, your, your life will be better, you know, if you just kind of leave me. I think maybe she feels a little bit like she's cursed. Here we're going to see again, as we've seen before, if you followed with us, especially in Genesis, now we've got two lines of people. And that's another theme that you'll see. You can trace that through all of the Old Testament and even into the New. But we see that through here, too. Two lines of people. Orpah decides to return to her family and to their gods. She probably thinks that her prospects for a good and full life are better in Moab. And that's what she knows. That's what she's comfortable with. So Orpah chooses that. But Ruth... Ruth actually echoes the covenant that God made with Abraham and chooses to cling to Naomi and to Naomi's God that she would have heard about being married into this family. So she would have heard about this God, but it wasn't the one that she was raised with. It wasn't the one that um, she had knew all the stories, you know, growing up. Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Ruth says to Naomi, did you see it? Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. By faith, more faith than Naomi had, Ruth chose a people and a God that she did not know. But she banked her life on it. To me, I see in there a little bit that we can only find redemption when we bind ourselves to God and his people. And this is where we begin to see Ruth's journey to find a home. That's another theme that we're going to trace through this book. Ruth finding a home. She leaves all that she knows, all the security of her original family, and even other marriage prospects. And she goes with Naomi. Naomi told her to go back and to find rest with another husband. So I looked up the word rest. Rest means to cease work or movement in order to relax, to relieve weariness, to be placed or supported so as to stay in a specified position or to... Um, or the instance or period of relaxing or ceasing to engage in strenuous or stressful activities. Rest. Maybe Ruth was looking for a different kind of rest. Maybe she knew deep down in her heart that Moab doesn't have what she's looking for. Empty. God will empty us so that we see our need for him and we choose to return to him. Verses 19 through 22, Naomi and Ruth are going back to Bethlehem. The author does the same thing again. He's saying, they're leaving Moab, leaving Moab. They're going back to Bethlehem again, giving us that contrast between Moab and Bethlehem. So they're leaving their land of compromise and now returning back to the house of bread, <laughs> to the place of God's promise and God's people. This time, though, Naomi has changed. Did you see that? The women of Bethlehem, they don't recognize her. They're like, is this, is this Naomi? So her life and her choices, maybe even her bitterness, changed her. So she's coming back, not the same woman she was when they left. Naomi even says, so her name means pleasant. She changes her name. She's like, call me Mara, which means bitter. She changed her own name. God didn't do it. So then it wasn't the end of her story. It wasn't who God wanted her to be. But it's who she was declaring herself to be. Mara, if you remember, in Exodus 15.22, Mara is um, this pool that while they were wandering in the wilderness, they 
God had provided water. They drank the water, they complained because it was really bitter. So I think he hit it, hit it with a stick and it changed the water to be sweet. So God changed bitter to sweet. And that's where she gets her name. That's where she gets her name. Maybe it's a maybe it's a cry to God to change me, you know, but that's she did change her name because she felt so bitter. The other thing I think that's interesting in here is that Ruth clung to a bitter woman. Is that usually our response to somebody who's difficult, somebody who's hurting, somebody who's bitter? Not usually. We usually distance ourselves, right? A little too much. I don't know what to do. I'm not to help you. But Ruth clung to her. And we'll see later how God uses that. But Ruth does eventually seek Naomi's good even over her own, which is another amazing part of her. So we see here that the returning to the Lord, Naomi and Ruth are returning to the Lord, but it's painful. They're both leaving things. Naomi, it's maybe painful because she's having to kind of humble herself and come home. Ruth, it's painful. She's leaving her family a culture of people that she knows and she's coming to Bethlehem. Returning to the Lord oftentimes involves some sort of loss. Right? We gotta leave something behind. Sometimes we like mm, even love our lives of compromise. And God will take away good things to get our attention or even to prove that he is all we need through our weakness and our loss. Here we are not saying that everything that you have suffered is, is for that, but I am saying that sometimes it is God's mercy, sometimes it is God's kindness to us, okay? So God will take away good things to get our attention. More often than not, he'll take away things that are not good for us, things that we trust in other than him. But it is always out of his mercy, always out of his kindness. Naomi thought that God was punishing her. She didn't see that he was bringing her back. She, he was bringing her back to him. The truth is, he was loving her. He was keeping his promise to her. Verse 21 is the crux of this chapter. It says, I went away full, the Lord has brought me back empty. So we end the chapter with a desolate woman with no one to care for her. She's coming back from Moab with a Moabite woman who has no legal standing, no reason to expect help or care from the people of Bethlehem. And they're coming back just as the barley harvest is beginning. Hope. We're not full yet, but hope as the barley harvest is there. Okay? As our friend Goldie says, followers of Jesus are intended to be God's people in God's place under God's rule. But we are sinners. We are rebellious. We prefer Moab over Bethlehem, oftentimes. So how are we even able to enter into rest that Naomi was trying to find for, um, for Ruth? How are we able even to get into the promised land? Because Jesus emptied himself. The reason we have hope for any type of true fulfillment or being filled is because he was made empty. Philippians 2, 6 through 9 says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore, God had highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And it goes on. But Jesus was made empty so that we could find, so we could be filled. So, we can be tempted to walk away, right? It's easy to want to walk away from circumstances in life where God has placed us, but it seems to us that he's not really providing for us, not doing a good job of taking care of us, or he's forgotten about us, or we just plain think it looks better over there, right? But the land of compromise will always leave us empty, always. So when are you tempted to leave the land of promise? Sometimes it looks like when we complain about our jobs, um, when we complain about our kids, um, complain about our spouse, lack of spouse. What's that daydream that you return to because you don't like what God has given you? What's that Netflix show that you watch because you don't think your husband's doing a good job, so we transfer that to Netflix, right? I'm getting my own stuff too. It all stings. It is tempting to leave the place of God's promise and provision when the bread seems scarce where we are and Moab seems to have what we really want. Where do you feel empty or disappointed, let down by God? Could it be his mercy at work in you? Sometimes we need to ask God to help us see our circumstances and our pain and disappointments the way that he sees them. Or do you need God's mercy to help soften your heart so you will return? So this passage in Ruth asks us again, why would we continue to seek life, healing, fulfillment from a powerless man-made water fountain when we have Jesus? Because when we are empty, Jesus is our true fulfillment. John says he's the bread of life. When we feel dead, Jesus is the only life that we need. John says he gives us life abundant. And when we feel bitter, when our life seems bitter, Jesus is the one who makes us sweet. But God will empty us so that we see our need for him and we will return to him. Let's go ahead and pray. God, I repeat Mary's prayer. I thank you for the power of your word. And I thank you that it, it changes us and that it shapes us. I thank you that together we get to search the depths of your truths written to us in your word. God, I ask that tonight you would um, just meet each of us where we are, where we need to hear your truth, where we need to be challenged, where we need to be encouraged. God, above all, I thank you that you are always faithful. And I thank you that you keep your promise, even when we are not faithful, when we don't believe you, when we struggle to trust, when we struggle to hang in there. You are always faithful. And you are always so gentle and kind to remind us of where we need to be. And may we be a community of women that helps each of us return to you when we need to. Father, we love you. I ask that you would be with the rest of our conversations tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.